Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction um, and to be welcomed into the space. Uh, very excited to join y'all. Inclusive teaching is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, although I have not been teaching formally in classrooms in a few years, um, it's really been a lot of professional development trainings uh, and things like that around the country. But one of the topics that uh, most frequently comes up in talking with instructors, whether it's graduate teaching assistants, folks who are adjuncts, folks who are tenured, uh, a very common uh, issue here is really about those moments in the classroom when you're not sure what to do. Um, and what has preceded that is some kind of comment uh, that might make our brain go, did they really just say that? Um, or perhaps in a discussion board or a comment in Zoom as folks are uh, online more and more for instruction. And those moments can be really difficult to grapple with. We're gonna break down some of the reasons for that so that we can understand some of the barriers and the challenges that we're facing. And once we can name and identify those, um, then we're gonna work on some really actionable strategies in order to respond in that awkward moment. Um, and hopefully to do so in a way that restores the inclusivity of the classroom that was just broken um, when that was expressed to folks. Uh, so, Really quickly, um, I will I will highlight as you can see on my slide here, uh, or is on my slide here, is that my pronouns are they, them, theirs. Um, without going into a whole extensive explanation, um, and I can certainly direct you to some resources about pronouns, including a little webinar by me, uh, <laughs> as my wonderful colleague, Dr. Leo Taylor, um, who is uh, at C uh, the Ohio State College of uh, Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences. Uh, but the brief explanation here, I include this on my slides as a way to proactively give people the opportunity to know how to most accurately and respectfully refer to me. Um, so I don't use he or she. Um, those are not comfortable for me. They don't reflect my lived reality. Um, I identify as non-binary or genderqueer. Um, and while that is a whole uh, other discussion potentially, um, this is one way that I can share who I am um, and give people the opportunity to to know how to refer to me. And you can just call me Lena, but if for some reason you feel the need to be formal, um, the honorific there is pronounced mix, just like you're mixing some gender stuff together and seeing what magic pops out today. Um, so you can call me mix Tenny. So with that said, that is one example of one of the things to consider about being proactive in your inclusive teaching, um, that some of the best work that we can do in responding to isms is to actually uh, minimize the chances that those things will arise in the classroom in the first place. And we'll talk about that at the end about how to be proactive. Uh, but one is to normalize folks sharing um, if they want. It should always be voluntary. It should never be mandatory. Um, but in introductions, perhaps on the first day, or in a discussion board, whatever it might be, that there's space for people to share their pronouns. Um, and this conversation is happening a lot more in our country and globally. Um, congratulations to our entire trans community on gaining the wonderful Elliot Page yesterday. It was a pretty big deal. <laughs> so with the humor aside, um, I wanna invite folks to self-reflect for a moment. Um, and then we will, uh, let's go ahead and do breakout rooms if we can do uh, about three to four folks and just have some small group discussion as folks are willing on on this topic here. So the prompt is asking what makes you hesitant to act, even if you still take action, even if you still do something. Um, when you witness racism, we're going to focus on racism as our primary example today. Um, Anti-racism work is my uh, passion and the work that I've been doing, but we'll talk about other um, elements of oppression, but specifically about racism. Um, if you can keep that as your focus, but also other isms. When you see those playing out in the classroom, what might give you uh, that moment of hesitation? Um, sometimes we feel this in our body. We can actually have a physiological response to the stressor. Um, and it can feel for a lot of folks, um, if you're anything like me, um, I have uh, uh, diagnosed anxiety anyway. So my hands are always a little bit shaky, but when this kind of moment plays out, I, I can feel my hands getting shakier. Like that's one way that I know um, that I'm reacting to what's uh, uh, playing out. Um, another common feeling is that feeling in the pit of your stomach, uh, like you are going down a staircase in the dark and you don't realize there's one more step left or that elevator on campus that like, there's no way that that building is ADA compliant and that elevator needs replaced um, and, and you know to expect it, but it drops that extra floor really fast. Um, that kind of feeling in your body. 
And in thinking about that, invite you to also consider what the hesitations might look like in action. So I'll, I'll give an example here. Um, so one possibility uh, is if a student says something that you know reinvokes a long existing stereotype about uh, a, a group of people of color. Um, and I know that I should act because I'm the instructor, but I might still have those feelings. Um, and what my hesitation might look like in action, for example, might be me staring blankly at the screen for about five seconds while there's extremely awkward silence on the entire Zoom call. Um, so that's one manifestation. Um, feel free to think of other ways that that might show up for you. Um, and as we split into smaller groups, let's go ahead and give it, um, it's not gonna do it justice by any means, but we'll give it about five to seven minutes. Um, if folks can be as uh, incisive and brief as possible um, while uh, being able to share of yourself as much as you have capacity to here today. Um, and, and there is no expectation that you share more than you have the ability to right now. Are you ready, Lena? Yeah, let's do it. Put in the chat if you would like to share it to the folks who aren't in your particular group. Um, I'm going to keep proceeding. Um, and want to recognize at this point that that is one of the challenges of teaching online and via Zoom for a lot of folks right now, and um, it came up in the group that I was in, uh, is, you know, it's different right now than in a face-to-face -face, uh, classroom setting, right? Because if you are, for example, if you are doing a lecture um, or if you are facilitating dialogue, uh, it can be really, really tough to have the ability to pay attention to a million different things at once. And we actually know that brains are not designed to do that. Um, in the first place. So I certainly, um, in some facilitated dialogue around race and anti-racism um, over the last few months, have had a couple of moments where things were put in the chat that as the facilitator, I didn't see it uh, because I was doing my thing, going through my content, um, and it caused issues because it was super racist. <laughs> um, so thinking proactively about uh, what we can do in order to when possible to reduce the chance of that happening. And that can include thinking through, you know, when do you want the chat feature on and when do you not? Do you set guidelines um, for how to use the chat, uh, which Melinda did for us so kindly at the beginning here of letting folks know that it can be used for questions and whatnot. Um, do you have the ability to set a timer or a reminder to check the chat every however many minutes? Um, there's lots of strategies that folks can use, but I wanna recognize that that's one of the challenges of this moment. Um, which dovetails just beautifully with the challenge of 2020 being a global pandemic um, and uh, racism by all means has been around for 500 plus years uh, and at the, at the same time um, that 2020 has seen the longest uh, mass protest in the history of what's now known as the United States with regards to race um, and police brutality after the public murder of George Floyd um, in particular right so um, a reminder that these things, uh, they're gonna come into the classroom. They might not always be obvious, right? Um, so depending on your topic and the material, it might not seem like a direct connection. Um, whereas when I was uh, TAing, I was uh, teaching uh, Introduction to Women's and Gender Studies in Oklahoma. Uh, so I've got stories to tell by all means. Um, but thinking through like in a classroom like that, I think folks are pretty well uh, expecting for those kinds of social issues and racial justice issues uh, to come up. And it might not be as expected in a different field, right? So thinking through how it might manifest in health sciences beyond just things like uh, medical disparities and health disparities. Um, and I will uh, leave y'all, regardless of, of timing, I will make these slides available to you. A bunch of them are just going to be resources that we're not actually going to go through today. They're takeaways, um, but they're embedded in the PowerPoint so that you've got them all in one nice, uh, neat place, a bunch of hyperlinks to, um, to talks and whatnot. So I just want to recognize the particular challenges um, that a lot of us are facing in 2020 um, and recognize that for a lot of folks, one of the hesitations might be one's own identity and how that plays into so much of perceptions and misperceptions by students. Uh, so for example, uh, a very common uh, issue is when faculty of color talk about their experiences and challenging racism in classrooms, it can lead to things like negative student evaluations at the end of the semester, which can influence things like tenure and promotion, right? So I think we have to name these realities and grapple with them. Um, and at the end of the day, 
that uh, this is not going to be prescriptive in this webinar. It's really going to be about exploring these elements and finding out, you know, for you, what is your baseline? What are your goals? What are your boundaries? Um, and that is going to look different from anyone else on the call. Um, and so we're not going to be looking for the truth with a capital T like we often do in academia. Instead, we're going to be looking for our truth with a little t. Um, and there's not a right and a wrong here. Um, so with that said, again, feel free to drop um, any of those takeaways in the chat. Uh, and I will go ahead and back this up with some uh, academic theory. Our experiences are inherently valid. And also, it can be nice when you work in an institution to be able to cite the most recent publications, right? Um, so highlighting a couple of elements, and this might just give a more formal name to some of the things you've experienced as well, if you haven't heard these terms. One that can be useful is this idea of racial anxiety. To be clear, in this academic term, we're not talking about um, all of the post-election postmortems of America that happened in 2016, um, when people were saying that racial anxiety is the reason that Donald Trump was elected. Um, that actually was just a way to not say racism was the reason that Donald Trump was elected, right? So talking about economic anxiety and racial anxiety, this is a different concept from that. I want to be really clear. Um, so when these folks um, who are in critical legal studies uh, talk about racial anxiety, they're talking about it in conjunction with a number of things. This worry before a conversation that's going to happen around race and racism, a concern that they're going to encounter racism in that conversation about racism. Um, feel free to nod if that rings true for you. So the idea is a lot of the time when we do things like have intergroup dialogue, um, this is a fear that is very much grounded in reality. People end up saying stuff, uh, particularly white people, end up doing and saying things that are racist um, accidentally or on purpose in those conversations about race and anti-racism. Um, so that's what the focus tends to be for folks of color, whereas for white folks, most of the time, um, our concern is going into that conversation and worrying that we're going to be the one, like we're going to be the total jerk who accidentally does or says something racist. Um, a very common question that I would get while I was at the Kerwin Institute, people would always be incredibly shy or like, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying, I like just don't know a lot about race. Um, and white folks would say, I just don't know if it's, if the word is black or African American, like which one? Um, and that's one of the challenges that we have. Um, we are definitely going to have uh, students come into the classroom. We are going to have colleagues in department meetings um, who do not know some of the more basic um, common terminologies. And that is a very real barrier for us having meaningful conversations that aren't harmful to people of color in the room, right? Um, what ends up happening, and again, this is well documented, is things just get really, really awkward, including in classroom settings. Um, and oftentimes we have things around avoidance, shorter interactions, um, changes in the way that we interact with one another. Um, and this tweet summarizes some work from Dr. Cheryl Matthias, who does a lot of work on whiteness uh, in higher education and K-12 education. Um, it's uh, summarized here by a doctoral student. Uh, and really what Dr. Matthias is saying is that white people and people of color both experience fear in discussing race. So does that, does that ring true in terms of your experience and also how we tend to frame these conversations, right? So think back to whatever uh, diversity training you might have done most recently, um, if you've done several, how often are those framed by facilitators, myself included? This is definitely what I have done in practice by saying it's really hard to talk about isms and we're going to do it anyway. Um, so there is a lot of value in recognizing the difficulty and the fear and the anxiety. Um, Dr. Matthias's work has invited me to go a bit further there. Um, so then she adds on that while people of color's fears are based in tangible and historical events, right? Um, events of mass violence and interpersonal violence oftentimes, uh, white people's fears are of not wanting to be labeled racist or being made to feel uncomfortable. And then here is really the clincher um, stating very clearly that equating those two experiences as equal is white supremacy in action. Um, so this is one of the things that we really need to be aware of, particularly my fellow white folks on the call, is thinking through, yes, your anxiety and fear is valid. Um, those anxieties around, I don't want to make it, make it worse. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want a student to escalate. Um, those are real. And at the same time, we always have to keep in mind that they're not the same as what our, co our colleagues of color are encountering. And for folks of color on the call, 
um, want to validate uh, that they're, you know, it when people try to essentially gaslight you and tell you that you're overly concerned about how people perceive you in the classroom, um, you're not overly concerned. It's completely grounded in reality. Um, you're not alone, and it it doesn't it shouldn't be this way. Um, and yet here we are. And then just one final point here in terms of framing. I really appreciate this in terms of a lot of the conversation that has happened, particularly uh, once again post election about ideas of like civil discourse and civility in the classroom. Um, and these ideas of having difficult conversations with people who have different political opinions and whatnot. Um, personally, uh, I think that the term civility often gets weaponized against people who are marginalized as a way to silence us and tell us that we're not allowed to talk about our pain that we're supposed to set it aside in order to be nice to the very people who are oppressing us. Um, and so this is a really helpful tool. Feel free to use this kind of framing. Um, Dr. Gorski's uh, Twitter is public, recommend you follow him. Um, but pointing out that when we talk about like finding middle ground in the classroom, when we disagree, um, that sometimes it's not about middle ground, it's about justice and injustice. Um, there's no space between, there's no such thing as non-racist. For example, there's only anti-racist and racist. Uh, so you've got to choose what you're doing. So, um, and a reminder to those of you who have been dealing with this maybe your entire life, uh, <laughs> that it is not too extreme to expect for there to not be racism and other isms um, that really should be our baseline. So with that said, um, just a little bit of mention here of research around the idea of being an active bystander. That's the approach that we'll use here. And folks who have taken a um, psychology or sociology class that might uh, ring familiar. Essentially, this is the very common human social norm and practice that when things go down, particularly in urgent and emergency situations, that uh, human behavior is actually relatively predictable, but doesn't make a whole lot of sense in, in some ways. So what often happens is when an ism is articulated in a classroom, that a lot of the time um, folks don't do or say anything. So how many times have we been, and even you know, in a faculty meeting or in a graduate seminar you were in one time or whatever it is, um, that a lot of the time it's met um, with inaction and that is because of two things. One is the, the diffusion of responsibility. So the more folks who are witnessing the incident, the less likely that any individual person will take meaningful action. Um, and that is strongly influenced by the element of social influence, which is that uh, humans are incredibly anxious critters by nature in reality, and we monitor group behavior and people's perceptions of us. So most of the time, most people um, do not like to violate social norms unknowingly. I think that's really a key piece here. Um, I violate social norms all the time by just existing as a genderqueer person, but I still get like really anxious and embarrassed when I mess up um, in a meeting or get called out because I did something hurtful, right? So I think that that's the important differentiation here. So because uh, there is a tendency to not act, I want to invite everyone on the call to think through what your responsibility as an instructor is uh, to disrupt the bystander effect. So one quick tip and trick, uh, you don't have to have the perfect words all the time. Actually, one of the best things you can do as the person who is perceived as having the authority in that classroom, um, no matter how flat you try to make your structure, uh, is to say something, do something, stop it in its tracks. Um, my colleague, Sophia Antoon, um, who's at the Multicultural Center at OSU, talks about this in terms of uh, the primary priority is always to stop the hurt, right? So when harm is being done, the point of intervening is to stop the harm. It is a lovely bonus if we also get to have an educational moment come out of that. Um, but I really appreciate her um, articulation of that is that that should always be the first priority um, because sometimes we get caught up in the idea of like, well, will I alienate the student who did something that was really transphobic um, and think through, well, first we've got to deal with the transphobia. Um, then we can help folks manage their reactions to being called out. Um, but this is just uh, the entire world um, for, I don't know, 400 years, but especially this year. Um, so the idea is we just pretend things are fine, but most people in the room are feeling really uncomfortable and we've lost the inclusivity that we've tried to establish. Here's where we will uh, click through a few things. Let's go ahead and do this as self-reflection um, and feel free to jot notes or whatever that looks like for you and, and to keep thinking about this. Certainly, again, we don't have time to do it justice. But one of the things that's really important to know about yourself 
um, is where you tend to gravitate in terms of if you feel like there's a difference in uh, those moments in the classroom where it's your identity that's being targeted or you being targeted in some way versus those moments when it's not about you, um, it's sort of about someone else. Uh, so I'll, I'll use a personal example just to kind of model this. Um, so for example, as someone who is trans, uh, what, I wasn't out certainly when I was uh, teaching, but one of the things that came up was in a paper, so not face-to-face -face conversation, um, a paper in which a student who is a veteran um, expressed um, some incredibly uh, disturbing views about trans people, um, and uh, they were very dehumanizing, and it was very much around the, the, the argument around should trans people be allowed in the military. Um, and uh, there was a lot of really strong language used, and so I was in this position where suddenly uh, this, you know, it's in incredibly personal, this personal, this is about me, even though no one knew it, I barely knew it. Um, and how does that feel? So I think back to that, you know, what were the emotions I was feeling? In academia, we usually all only hold space for thinking, but let's be real, we're all real humans and we need space for um, our emotionality in these situations. Um, and asking myself, okay, that's about an identity I hold, but does it feel the same or does it feel different when something racist happens? Um, so when I guest lectured and um, a student used the N-word full in full, a white student, hard R and everything, um, not about me because I'm not black. Um, how does that feel? <laughs> and the really important question here is how does it influence how you act? That's a really big question. So thinking for yourself, um, and feel free to do like raise hands or whatnot. How many of y'all you tend to, um, and I recognize this is a false binary as many are, but you tend to gravitate towards the idea of like, those two things feel pretty different for me. Like I, I feel like that situation is different and I tend to handle it differently if it's about me versus if it's about one of my students. Um, or um, totally valid <laughs> for some folks, how many of y'all feel like, you know, bias is bias is bias. It's all kind of the same thing. We're all in this together. Um, so it doesn't necessarily feel um, particularly differentiated to me. There's certainly space in the middle there. But this is important, again, just for you to know for yourself because it's gonna help you be prepared uh, to speak or type or however you are expressing yourself when these things go down. Um, and you don't have to do as much thinking of like, well, am I, uh, am I too close to this situation? Am I being overly sensitive? All of this like self gaslighting, those of us with marginalized identities are taught to do um, of being like, well, I think maybe the student didn't mean it and they don't know better, even though I was really hurt by that. So I'm just not gonna rock the boat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just knowing that about yourself um, and importantly, again, how it influences the way that you show up um, this can include knowing how to manage your emotions. Um, so for example, I find them to be very different. And personally, I am a lot more upset when an ism happens and it's targeting someone else. Um, my personal experience is that, uh, quite frankly, I deal with this stuff en enough, like getting this gender daily, um, that it, it doesn't necessarily get to me most of the time. Like this is my day job and my existence. So like, whatever, I don't have the energy um, to deal with this. But um, if someone misgenders one of my young students, like, no, I will, I will immediately be um, correcting that misgendering and inviting um, that person to, <laughs> to do better, right? Uh, and so other folks feel differently. For some folks, it's easier to speak up for self because it's your experience. You don't have to worry about stepping on anyone else's toes. You don't have to worry about being um, like a weird white savior that no one asks to come in. Um, and interrupt the racism. Like there's all of these dynamics that you don't necessarily have to deal with. Um, and some of us have developed certainly um, quick and perhaps witty responses to the really common microaggressions that we might encounter around our own identities. So those are just a few ideas. I will say um, around the question of, um, you know, if it's not about me, and I'm trying to be a good ally and intervene. Uh, one of the ways to navigate that is to think through uh, you know, what you, what you can do in that space without causing further harm. Um, so as a white person, my best recommendation um, is when racism happens, for example, um, if you are a white person, uh, don't leave it to your students of color to have to defend themselves or affirm their humanity. Um, that's not their job. They're here to get an education, um, not teach white students how to not be racist. Um, so as an instructor, what you can do 
um, is be mindful of the dynamic that folks might want to speak for themselves. And you can give it just that one awkward second. Don't let it linger. Don't not act. Uh, but then frame your response accordingly. And it could be something like, OK, um, so I want to be really clear. I'm really not the expert on this. Like um, race and racism is, is not what I study, and it is not what I live in my personal experience. Um, so I'm not the expert. But I, I'm fairly certain that that language is considered outdated um, and therefore pretty offensive. Um, so if, if someone else knows better and is willing to share with us um, and help us out, that would be great. Um, but if not, I'm going to suggest that we use this language instead. Um, and or I'm going to go learn more about what the most up to date language is. A really common way that this manifests um, often in writing is when white students, um, particularly those from homogenous communities, uh, might, um, instead of saying person of color, um, and this is where I'm going to articulate something that is very outdated and offensive, um, might articulate it instead as colored people. Um, like, that's not cool. <laughs> and um, it's something that we have to be aware is going to happen. It happens all the time. So thinking through how do you already have a pre-planned response for the next time someone writes that in a response paper um, that you already know you're just going to put a little note um, and say, oh, I think you mean people of color. Um, especially if we're thinking about folks that English might not be the primary language. Um, and uh, you know, it, it could seem really confusing when you don't know the racial context of the United States, which is very particular, right? So thinking through how we can do that. So my best recommendation is if you are seeking to be an ally or in solidarity, or my favorite model is that of co-conspiracy, and that's the work of Dr. Bettina Love. She does a lot of work on abolitionist teaching. Um, the idea is to speak up and also to not cause harm in the process like recognize where you're coming from um, and elevate the platform if someone who does have the identity wants to speak for themselves, but make sure that it doesn't go unaddressed. A few things um, that I just wanna uplift in terms of context for you to consider proactively as much as possible. And again, this goes back to the idea of knowing your, uh, your sort of preferences, um, your proclivities, and even uh, really what your boundaries are for yourself. So in terms of safety, I'm just gonna acknowledge this and then set it to the side. Hopefully none of us um, end up encountering a physically unsafe situation due to an ism in the classroom. And if that were to be the case, um, I want to remind you that the first priority is always um, people staying safe, right? Um, so if you need to just leave a classroom or leave a Zoom room, you have every right to do that. <laughs> Like that's okay, it doesn't make you cowardly, it doesn't make you a hypocrite. Um, and safety isn't just physical, it can be things like emotional safety. Um, there is emotional violence that people are experiencing every single day in their jobs in higher ed because of their identities. If you need to take care of yourself and turn your camera off in the faculty meeting, do it if you need to. Um, that's okay, you don't need my validation, but there it is for you. Um, and uh, one example is around sexism. Um, so for example, if anyone's, for anyone who's experienced street harassment, um, my guess if, is if you're anything like me, uh, you have yet to turn around and confront a young gentleman and scholar uh, about the underlying patriarchal assumptions that he might be making about uh, women's bodies uh, and that they are public property uh, to be dictated to. No, like you're not about to submit a thesis about that. Uh, it's okay to just move in the opposite direction more quickly and get to somewhere that is safer. Um, so again, it's not hypocrisy and it doesn't mean that you missed your chance to do good. Power dynamics, particularly thinking around um, the academic structures around things like tenure um, or when folks are not being paid a living wage, for example, um, but you need that job. That's part of the economic power dynamics. So make sure to consider those before and think about, you know, if you're tenured, now is definitely the time that you can be bold, right? Like you have a far more protection than your colleagues do. Um, and particularly if you have the dominant identity, you're not gonna receive as much blowback um, when you do the work of allyship. So thinking about how to do that um, and thinking about, for example, if you're a grad instructor, um, that doesn't mean you're without power. <laughs> it means you might not have the same institutional authority 
but you do have a lot of power and influence in your classroom, for example, um, and helping folks to understand that it doesn't have to be this way, right? We don't have to do academic hazing um, and uh, make sure everyone's miserable when they're doing their degrees. And um, we can actually be proactive in mitigating some of those things. Uh, really all of that comes down to self-preservation. And um, one of the things to consider is who's in the room and who's not. Um, a really common dynamic is to think through, well, I mean, what they said was not very good, um, but to my knowledge, there isn't a gay person in the room. So like the homophobia didn't necessarily hurt anyone. Um, that's a common thought process. I um, just wanna uh, invite folks to think about how part of our, our cultural issue in the United States is that these things are not only systemic, uh, they're also incredibly pervasive. And so when we don't push back against them, they continue to be the norm. Um, so it's not only about the hurt feelings of an individual person witnessing or experiencing discrimination, it's about what kind of society we want to have. None of us created this society, we inherited it, certainly, um, but also we have the power to change it. Um, even if you frame that as, um, you know, this is uh, my classroom, and in this classroom, <laughs> we are going to behave in these ways. Thinking through culture and norms, um, that could mean a lot of different things, depending on what your field is. I'm thinking about, you know, do you use these skills in conference presentations in the future as a moderator, et cetera. Um, and then at the end of the day, uh, I invite you to think, um, spend some solid time thinking about what your personal values and priorities are, particularly your number one. What is the hard line, the boundary that you are not willing to cross? Um, and whatever it is, it's inherently valid, but it's gonna look pretty radically different for different folks. Um, I'll just use myself as an example here. For me, I think at, at this point in my life, I have the privilege that my ultimate priority is maintaining my integrity. It has a lot to do with how I was raised with family um, and religious influences and whatnot. Um, I now am in a fin financially secure place post-grad school um, that I would be okay if I spoke up and um, got in trouble and were to be terminated or something like that. Um, so for me, I have that convenience right now because I don't financially support anyone else, just you know, per Good Marshall and Ruth Bader Ginsburg and they're, they're pretty inexpensive, right? Um, if you have people who depend on you, whether it is elders, folks with disabilities, kids, um, if people are leaning on you financially, it is okay to have that be your ultimate priority. Doesn't make you a hypocrite, doesn't mean you're selling out, um, it is okay to preserve your job and keep it intact um, if that is what you need to do. Um, and don't judge other folks for their contexts. Um, we certainly want to invite everyone to join with us in the work of anti-racism and liberation, um, but recognizing that we might not always know um, the hard stopping points for other folks, um, even if there might be more obvious ones around things like, um, you know, who is currently chair uh, or who has tenure. All right, we're doing great on time. So this is not to convince you <laughs> why to be an active bystander, you probably wouldn't have joined here uh, in this conversation, but rather thinking through some additional framing and I invite you to use this in your classrooms with students. Um, what would it look like for part of syllabus day to be to talk about the culture of our classroom, which I'm sure many of you are already doing. So feel free to use any of these examples. Um, so one of the best teaching examples that I've been able to use over the years has been around this idea of intentions versus outcomes. I um, mean, it's pretty obvious when you really uh, point it out, but for a lot of folks, this is something that um, students coming to your classroom might not have ever thought about before. Um, so I use this example of a vase. Um, and if you think about um, if you were carrying this vase and it uh, slipped out of your hands because it was still wet from being washed and it falls, and it shatters. What's that scenario like? In, in a different scenario, let's say you, uh, in a moment of uncharacteristic rage at whatever Zoom calls you just had for eight hours straight, uh, you take that hammer that's in the background and you smash that base as, as a release. What's that scenario like? And the difference here um, is intentions. One was on accident, one was on purpose. But when we when we zoom out and we focus instead on the outcomes, we see the outcome is actually identical, right? The vase is broken regardless. Um, there's pieces everywhere. <laughs> um, and this is actually a lot like uh, all of us navigating systemically oppressive societies, right? Um, so even when we are good people, 
um, we can still be subject to implicit bias. We can still accidentally drop the vase and cause harm. Um, we don't get to tell people that we didn't cause them harm when they tell us that we did, right? And we don't get to say no vase. You know, it doesn't look that bad to me. Um, don't do all of that. Uh, but instead, to be brave and to recognize the outcome. And I think we can hold space for both. And I'm going to suggest that at the end of the day, what's most important is our outcomes uh, for uh, impact on, on other folks around us, right? Particularly when we're talking about students. So to be brave and when someone points out like, hey, you dropped the vase, that you can say, oh my gosh, I am so sorry, I did not realize. Thank you for letting me know. Um, looks like I've got some cleaning up to do. And that can be really difficult to do as an instructor when you're expected to be the knower of all things <laughs> um, or like sort of dominate or construct the space. But to think through what would it look like for us to be humble enough to recognize that even those of us with marginalized identities are never going to be totally perfect on all aspects of all um, areas of oppression, right? Um, I will say the, the link embedded here also uh, in some ways challenges the uh, common phrase in higher education of assume best intent. How many of us have been told that? Um, as we enter into difficult dialogues, um, full disclosure, I'm coded in it. That's part of why I, I really love it. Um, but a woman of color journalist really parses out um, that there can be times in which you don't have to assume best intent. If someone's continually harming you, perhaps it's okay to only hold people responsible um, for their outcomes. And this last bit of framing here, um, if you were to do one bit of additional reading, I would really suggest it be this essay by Dr. D.L. Stewart. Uh, and Z talks about uh, inclusion and justice, and not that these things are opposites, but rather thinking through what are the limits that we have self-imposed on ourselves in higher education around these topics. Um, and they have a whole bunch of these contrasting questions in this thought piece and in inside higher ed. So for example, uh, diversity and inclusion are really about numbers of people in a space and how they experience that space, right? Um, equity and justice are broader than that. Uh, so the invitation is, yes, we should keep talking about diversity and inclusion, and how do we move to talking more about equity and justice in addition to those? So an example here is that inclusion will ask the question, has everyone's ideas been heard? That's a really important question for our classrooms, um, but justice will respond, and whose ideas won't be taken as seriously because they aren't in the majority. So thinking about this, um, the research shows, um, particularly in graduate seminars, that there tends to be a strong gender dynamic um, around these questions. Yeah, seeing lots of nods. I've certainly never experienced this constantly every day of grad school. Um, so when we are satisfied with diversity and inclusion, um, it, it's, it's not enough, right? It's, oh, you know, people with minoritized genders are allowed in academia now. Yay, diversity. Uh, and, oh my gosh, she was allowed to say what she wanted, inclusion. Uh, but when we're aiming for justice, we would recognize, no, there is strong evidence uh, that shows that women are often spoken over in these settings. Um, credit for ideas is, is misapplied, right? Um, if you've ever had the experience where you had this brilliant interpretation of this reading, uh, and then someone, you know, a male colleague two minutes later is like, yeah, I really think, or piggybacking off of that, but they don't actually say anything new. And then everyone's like, you should do your thesis on that, man, right? Um, so this is not uncommon. And um, if, you have ne if you don't think you've ever uh, witnessed this, I invite you to look for it. You will certainly find it. So the idea here as an instructor is that we could prioritize justice and we could think through, how do I restore the justice in this space when I see this happening to women grad students? Um, and one practical tip um, is if you are the instructor, and this becomes even uh, easier to do if you are a man, um, that you can speak up and say, you know, I really appreciate how this conversation is going. It sounds like we're reaching some level of consensus on interpretation of this. Um, what a brilliant reading, Samantha. Um, that is such a great take. I appreciate you sharing it. Um, and thank you, Jonathan, um, for backing her up um, and expressing first agreement. Um, are, are you thinking about maybe teasing out this topic further for a poster presentation or a research project, Samantha, right? So we're navigating some troubled waters where we're not saying, yo, Jonathan, you total jerk. Um, how dare you be a misogynist um, and silence Samantha or steal credit for her idea, right? Um, 
but we are stopping the hurt because we are intervening in the situation and we're restoring the inclusivity and justice of the classroom and by making sure that credit goes to the person uh, that <laughs> actually said the thing, right? Um, and you can use that in meetings. I have found it to be incredibly effective um, and particularly for folks who are women um, or were assigned female at birth and socialized into womanhood, the expectation for us is that we be nice at all times, right? Um, so if you struggle um, oftentimes with being misperceived, particularly women of color being misperceived as being angry, um, thinking through what are those stereotypes that already exist that I'm going to have to deal with um, and how do I want to navigate this? I mean, one possibility, um, I'm not all for killing them with kindness, but we can certainly uh, navigate difficult situations by encouraging people to perceive us as kind, if that makes sense. Um, it can be really helpful. Some would say it's manipulation. I say it is strategy. Um, and then this last example here is around the environment safe, being safe forever and to feel like they belong. We want folks to be able to come to the classroom as their full selves, right? And Justice will add to that and ask whose safety is being sacrificed and minimized to allow others to be comfortable maintaining dehumanizing views. And as a DEI practitioner, I had to read this like four times um, because DL just drops the mic on this and it totally compelled me to do my work differently from there on out. Um, so a concrete way to think about this is that dynamic in which someone says something or does something in the classroom that is problematic uh, and how easy it is for our brains to sometimes say, well, yeah, that wasn't good, but I don't want to put that person on blast. Um, I don't want them to not feel welcome in this classroom. I don't want to shut things down. I don't want to call them out. Um, because you know what's the value in that. And those are really good questions to ask. And this helps us remember um, that we're actually not neutral in this idea of balancing because they're not the same things. So thinking about how the safety and humanity of people who are marginalized is always, always more important than the comfort of people in the dominant position. That's really the key takeaway is that safety is always more important than comfort. So yes, if a white student says or does something accidentally racist, uh, we should still intervene. And there's lots of ways to do that tactfully and educationally. But the important thing is we have to say something um, because it's not okay to allow the racism um, to go forward unchecked. Okay, so in terms of practical, like what do I actually say? Um, there are so many options, and the great thing is that I've written a lot of them out, and they will be in the PowerPoint slides, so you can go and reflect on them as much as you like. Um, I'm going to invite us to think about these as buckets of strategies that you can draw from and invite you to think about uh, your strengths. So who are you as a person? Um, what are you already really, really good at? Your superpowers in terms of um, being a teacher, in terms of being a human, a communicator, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the idea is to maximize those strengths. Um, and to channel them in ways that are highly intentional to achieve the goals we're looking for. So you don't have to radically change your personality um, to become a good advocate for others and for self, right? Um, just be your USD you, and a lot of the time that that will uh, come through for you. And a reminder here that uh, Cornell West talks about um, the fact that justice is what love looks like in public. So this is actually very loving educational work that we're doing. People sometimes think of it as punitive or harsh. Um, that's not the case. It's one of the most kind and loving things we can do um, because accountability really is a, a generous form of kindness. Um, we have this gift here from one of my favorites, The Emperor's New Groove, um, in which they spy broccoli um, in the villain's teeth and they're like, what? how long has that been there? So this is one way that we can think about it when we're the ones who mess up. Because I want to be clear, we're all on this call because we're trying to do our best um, and we're still going to be the one to step on it, some step in it sometimes. Uh, so thinking through when someone points out that you have done or said something that is an ism, um, remember what it's like to have broccoli stuck in your teeth and go through the rest of post lunch with broccoli in your teeth and none of your colleagues mention it. You get home and you're like, How? like, are none of you real friends? Like, come on, you couldn't just tell me I it would have avoided so much embarrassment. It's actually pretty much the same principle around isms. Um, so if you say something that is accidentally ableist, um, you don't recognize that it can be really harmful to folks who have disabilities and someone points it out, uh, treat it as if they are letting you know that you've got some broccoli in your teeth and say, oh my gosh, I had no idea. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now that I know better, I'm going to do better and then actually, you know, go forth and do better. Um, 
And here is some stuff that you can come back to. We won't go through this. This is going to be uh, where there's a lot of the resources, but some ideas about how to kind of ground yourself when you do find yourself getting called out. Um, it can be really helpful um, to just have a baseline about how to deal with that because it is emotional, um, especially for those of us who work really hard to be um, good advocates. I'll also let you do this as a take home um, to watch this YouTube video as an example of one of our strategies, which is using humor. It might seem counterintuitive um, to a lot of folks because we're generally taught not to talk about race in public, much less joke about it. Um, but this is an example of a whole rapid fire series of microaggressions um, against this Asian American woman, um, some of the really common ones, and her response in a way that is kind of lighthearted and humorous um, and doesn't play into the stereotypes. Um, but rather kind of just, you know, serves as a foil and, and makes some commentary. Um, I like to think I'm a pretty witty person, but uh, I have severe anxiety, uh, so I'm not always quick enough to do the humor thing. But if you're someone who is really witty, if your friends think that you're hilarious and you've always got a, a good joke, um, that can really be a superpower. A common one, it can be as simple as when people ask me, um, what are you? Um, which is a, a question around gender. I know that, but they're not brave enough to say like, no, what's your gender? Um, my response these days is usually human. How about you in just that tone? Because it's goofy. It tends to disarm people instead of uh, them reacting with anger that I'm telling them that that's not an appropriate question. Um, and it can spark some additional dialogue. So for me, that's comfortable and helpful. Um, for another trans person, it might not be. Um, so thinking through again, all of this is deeply personal and it's not prescriptive. <laughs> not everyone's going to use the same strategies. Um, and another way that we can think about this is, for example, when folks say, oh, you speak such good English, um, perhaps to someone who's a PETA identified um, and responding to something like, oh my gosh, I hope so. It's the only language I know. Um, or I've been speaking it my entire life or whatever it is, or I'm studying, I have an English degree. <laughs> so whatever it is, um, you can be kind of goofy and that can be really helpful. Um, if you are someone who is more literal, you're pretty just like what you see is what you get. That is also an unrecognized superpower. So thinking through how you can channel that, particularly in a lot of these situations where American English and slang oftentimes does this weird thing of having shorthand phrases that don't make literal sense like at all um, and are super problematic when you think about it, but you might not know unless it's your identity or someone points it out, right? So thinking about literalism in the face of that and how that can be really helpful. Uh, so uh, a few examples here, when people try to tell one of those off-color jokes that they're like, oh man, when we used to say these things in the 60s, uh, you can, you can just challenge that and be literal and ask them like, is this a joke? Or say something like, I, is there a punchline coming? I'm still not laughing. Um, and again, there's certainly dynamics around things like gender and perception that you will want to navigate, but thinking through it as an option. Um, and here's one that is really um, pretty hidden, um, but indigenous folks have been very clear for very long um, that casually using terms like powwow um, is, is uh, not particularly <laughs> appropriate. Um, and so when someone says, let's powwow at the end of the faculty meeting, um, or can I come have a powwow in your office for office hours, that you can be pretty literal in your response there. Um, another possibility is to show a literal parallel that people would feel really uncomfortable with. So it could be something like, no, it's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it much until recently, um, but I realize uh, it's kind of weird that we say let's powwow because there's no like so religious or cultural equivalent that we would feel okay saying that about. Like no one's going to be like, yo, can we have a quick mass after this meeting? Uh, no, that's super weird. So why do we do that um, around indigenous peoples? Oh, it probably has to do with the historicization and pretending like indigenous people don't exist anymore. And then you can have your whole rant. Um, but just some things to consider. Uh, questions. I'm sure a lot of you are really good at using questions in your teaching anyway. So thinking through uh, how you can facilitate some dialogue that might guide the conversation. Um, one of the bonuses here is that it can open up the space. So instead of um, so the idea of calling out is that we shut down the conversation because it's causing harm. Um, it can be very direct. Sometimes people misperceive it as being um, like aggressive or mean because we're not thinking about the balance of whose safety is being um, valued. Um, these strategies are really about calling in. So this idea of how do we continue the conversation in a way that's educational. Um, so this is one example of that, uh, particularly if you don't know someone's intent. Again, their outcome is most important. But if you are trying to think through, okay, this might be a first year student who literally does not know better. 
um, how can we have these conversations? Because most of us have been there, right? Um, so thinking through, you, you know, what do you what do you mean when you say that? Or can you tell me a little bit more? Elaborate on that. Or as we do in higher education and student affairs, let's unpack that. <laughs> um, thinking through, what does that word actually mean? Not in a condescending way, um, but do you do you know what that mean word actually means? I just learned in this webinar um, that did you know that the word "jip" actually is a form of a racial slur? No one told me that growing up, but actually I found out it's derived from the word gypsy, which is a slur against Romani people. Um, and we just use it in casual language for some reason. And now that I know that, I'm like appalled that I ever, you know, however you want to frame that, but it can be a very generous, like, do you know what that means? Because I didn't, right? Um, and then the thought process and then leading that, uh, ending that with how we reach different conclusions can be a really tactful way um, in a way that still keeps it academic, if that's one of the concerns um, that you're encountering. Saying you're uncomfortable, um, stating boundaries, I don't know, my therapist says that it works and I'm going to try it someday, I don't know. Um, but saying that you're uncomfortable can be really, really helpful and it can be about you or it can be about the space. So for example, um, I, was, I was raised Mormon and one of the things that Mormons don't do is swear. So middle school was a blast. Um, and so this was how I set boundaries with my friends at the time and it was incredibly effective actually. So I set the expectation um, of saying, hey, like I know that this is like your new favorite word, I get it. Um, can I just ask that you not use it around me or, or try to be mindful, right? Um, and folks were almost always incredibly respectful about that. Um, because I was setting my own boundary. Um, but it can also be something about the classroom. I'm like, that's not really appropriate in, this, in a discussion post. Um, <laughs> if you want to message me about that, um, then we can continue to have some private conversations. And in terms of conversations, um, one of my favorite strategies, so uh, if anyone on this call is like me and is, is a bit anxious, and perhaps when the really, did they really just say that moment happens, maybe your reaction is something along the lines of uh, just being like frozen and maybe thinking a million questions in your head and then realizing it's it five minutes have passed at this point and we're still thinking through like all the threads of what we're going to say um, and then you go home and maybe you guilt yourself the rest of the night about like why didn't I say something you know and then you come up with this brilliant argument that would have been hilarious but also research-based and you have an article that the students can read for further learning Right, but you've missed your chance. So this is for the I missed my chance people uh, in the space, which is, is me. Um, so one of the things that we can do is remember that uh, it's, there's not only one way to, to um, push back against these things. And it doesn't always have to be direct. Sometimes it can be a speed bump in order to give ourselves time to gather ourselves in our thoughts and come back. Or a speed bump that allows other folks to chime in who might know more. Um, or not feel those same kind of um, anxious pressures. So there's a number of ways to do this. My personal favorite, um, when I have nothing else to say and I just have memorized these, I just run through this list of which one I'm gonna do. Um, and so my go-to is, I'm not, I'm not sure how I feel about that or think about that is what I would usually say in an academic context, right? Um, even the one-worders are a great speed bump, just saying like, whoa, or I'm surprised to hear that from you. Um, it can actually spark some conversation. And again, signal, the really important thing here is signal to the other folks in the classroom that what is happening is not okay and is not gonna go unchecked. Um, I'm forgetting my citation, but there is a study that looked at different forms of bias interruption by instructors. And what they found is that the, uh, actually the key thing was just saying or doing something. The form that it took did not particularly matter that much to students. Um, the uh, real influencer of how they perceived that classroom as inclusive or not inclusive after an incident was whether the instructor actually addressed it. Um, so again, you don't have to have all the perfect words. You don't have to be an expert on every single element of shifting language in order to affirm people's humanity. Um, it's good to keep up to date and uh, we can only do so much, right? 
direct communicators, this is your time to shine as well. <laughs> Just tell it like it really is. Um, and we know from psychology research uh, that I statements can be a really helpful formula for us to follow. You can just fill in the blank. Here's an example I'll use around ableism because I um, thankfully don't hear this as much lately, but certainly did a lot when I was in college and when folks use the R word, which is how I'm going to refer to it. Um, so like when you say when you say that it makes me feel sad, like basically as a society, we've kind of just conflated civility with like badness. Right. So even though I know you're not trying to be hurtful, I know you don't mean anything by it. I just can't help but feel sad that we use that word, you know, so casually. Um, and these days I would probably add something about like, you know, you're actually referring to me like you might not realize this. Um, I don't think I've told you, but I do have these mental health and cognitive, <laughs> um, you know, I had a concussion and now I have these things. So when you can share your personal story, if that's something that you are willing and able to do, um, personalizing it can be incredibly helpful. Um, the research actually shows that that is why the gay rights movement um, made such rapid progress relative uh, for example, the fight for racial equality, uh, the, it's like night and day in terms of how fast things changed in terms of policy. What they found is that a lot of it was, was that LGBTQ people um, are mostly embedded in families and were able to change hearts and minds by sharing their struggles. And then their family members were able to change hearts and minds by sharing the struggle of that person, if that makes sense. Whereas with racial dynamics, we're so highly segregated um, that it's not the same dynamic. Um, most white people only spend meaningful time with other white people, which means you're not necessarily hearing stories of people of color um, or recognizing racism still exists. All right, uh, this one can be really helpful as well, um, particularly for the folks that you know are well intended but really struggle with things like um, particular language that can be offensive. Um, and also, this can be helpful for that tenured person uh, who is just never going to change. You've tried everything and short of institutional accountability, it's just not working. Um, so there's two different tacks here. So one, um, if you know they're trying to be an ally, you can recognize that, right? So mitigate the defensiveness that comes automatically with being called out um, and recognize, you know, make sure you're telling them that you know they're not a bad person, they just messed up, right? So I know you wanna be an ally, that's exactly why I wanted to check in about that language. Um, so it turns out, um, yes, the word queer can be used by LGBTQ people, um, but for people who are not LGBTQ, we probably shouldn't really be using that term, um, or we should respect how people want to use that term for, them, for themselves. Um, and this one can be really helpful. You can throw the institutional handbook at people if you need to. Again, this is really when you've tried the other things and they're not working. At some point, this is harm mitigation. You're not gonna change their heart or mind. Um, but you might prevent um, another critical incident from happening to a different student um, or colleague. Um, Title IX and Title VII are, are wonderful things that we can use um, to back this up. A few final ideas. Um, hopefully <laughs> this won't happen too much, but you might need to remove someone from the situation. Again, if, if people have been repeatedly um, asked to take accountability for their words, um, it is okay to stop the harm in the only way possible. Um, so um, going back to the, the example I gave of a white student using the N-word in class repeatedly, um, I was co-presenting with a dear friend of mine um, who's a black woman who just was like, well, yeah, we had lots of conversations afterwards. And I had this moment of like, this is a time that I need to do something. And so to be able to say as the person with the perceived authority and literally standing on a stage in a lecture hall to say, I'm stopping you there. Normally, I wouldn't cut people off, but you are actively causing harm to people by using that racial slur. Um, regardless of what you think about that word and who has the right to say it, you need to stop right now. And if you say it again, you will leave this classroom. Um, and that a lot of students were really grateful for that very clear directive of shut up <laughs> um, around this particular thing. It's not about silencing opinions. Um, and then to say, we can have conversations about this later. And what we're not going to do is like have this harm happening in public. Um, and that can be a really good way to frame it, um, particularly if you have given them multiple chances. Um, you can also remove yourself. That's a possibility. That's a bit hard when you are the one responsible for instruction. Um, but think of this as a possibility, um, for example, for any virtual, I hope, holiday gatherings that one might have in the winter months um, is that we can recognize, you know, I can't agree to disagree. This is too important for that. Um, but I will ask that we not have this fight right now. 
and that can be a way to, to reclaim your time, as the great Maxine Waters has said. And then we'll just wrap here with these last few minutes, just thinking about the things that you can do proactively. Um, so those are really focused on what you as an individual person can do within your context, knowing your boundaries, having your strategies. Again, I would advise people to think through those buckets and any others that you can think of. What am I already good at? And how do I just channel that intentionally ahead of time so that I have a plan? Having a plan is a really big element of it. And this is where those of us who have anxiety um, actually have a superpower because we love to plan for worst case scenarios, um, which actually, this is my, uh, my <laughs> neurodiverse brain here coming back to the point that I was making earlier about the speed bumps. I forgot to note that part of the value of speed bumps is the signaling and part of the value is the opportunity to follow up. So you can go home and you can think about it, but instead of using all that anxious energy to shame yourself or think about what you should have done, instead say, I did something, I interrupted the bias and how am I going to continue this conversation when we have our next classroom meeting? I think I'm going to start the meeting by acknowledging um, what happened in the last class session, because it was in the last two minutes and we couldn't really get into it. Acknowledge what happened, have some space for some dialogue, and make sure that I remind students that my, uh, my student hours, renamed from office hours to be more inviting, particularly the first generation students um, who have often been taught that the idea is uh, going to office hours means that you're not smart enough, but in my student hours that you're welcome to talk about your experience in the course, not just any gaps in knowledge, right? Um, but thinking through and putting together your strategy because you did already um, kind of put your foot in the door. Um, but as much as we can influence policy and structure that can be really helpful, um, some of these are directly in our control. Um, for example, um, how you're drafting your own syllabi, thinking through that, um, what statements are you required to include, but which ones do you want to include? Um, perhaps uh, in addition to those. This is one example. Um, you can word it however you like. Um, shout out to Dr. Cami Day, the wonderful, wonderful women's and gender studies faculty who taught me this. So this is basically how all of her syllabi start out. The very first thing after her contact information is acknowledging the like by nature of this topic, because in this particular field, that's just how it is, right? We're gonna talk about these tough things. Um, recognizing that that can include disagreement and conflict, but also learning. Um, and then this is the really important part is still drawing a boundary and an expectation proactively um, and saying what's not going to be tolerated is the dehumanization of any person, whether they're in this classroom or not. And an example of how that can be really helpful is if something around immigration were to come up in class, whether you're actually studying immigration or if um, there's been a lot of critical bias incidents in the last four years in which people have said stuff that's really um, anti-Latinx and anti-immigrant um, when students have gotten up to present, for example, um, and being prepared. <laughs> and when that happens, be able to say, oh, I'm going to pause you right there before you go any further. Um, apologies to interrupt, but a reminder, we, we, we don't use dehumanizing language in class here. So when we're talking about immigrants, um, we're going to use the term immigrants. And we're not going to use the term illegals because that's inherently dehumanizing, right? Um, so I need I need you to use that term, um, or you can write it in the margin of their paper or whatever it is. And that was actually the tax that I took um, when the really transphobic stuff was written in the paper that I had to grade um, was a, to remind the person about the syllabus statement. And it was a whole moment where by the end of the semester we were like, maybe trans people are just normal people, and I was like, yes, <laughs> we did it. Um, so this, again, is setting a proactive expectation so students know what they're getting into and it can save you a ton of work because then you're doing reminders, especially if you're someone who has uh, students sign your syllabus and turn it back in at the beginning uh, of the semester and um, they can be like, remember, we all agreed to this um, this is how we're going to do this conversation. Um, and thinking about things like, um, there's not enough time certainly in the last minute to do all this, but start thinking if you haven't already about how you structure your classroom, what do introductions on the first day look like, particularly in virtual spaces? Um, have you considered putting your pronouns in your Zoom name? Um, that might be one possibility to signal to trans students um, that you are seeking to be an ally. For example, um, thinking about communication prior to the first day, can you send an email to everyone enrolled in the course and ask them to introduce themselves just to you virtually? And that that can include, uh, you know, what name is on the roster, what name you would like me to call you, 
Um, and uh, pronouns if you'd like to tell me. And Dr. Day always had, he did note cards the first day when it was in person. And the last thing was anything else you would like for me as your instructor to know. And students would often use that as an easy segue to disclose disability accommodations, for example, or to say I'm working for jobs, um, or I have a kid and might occasionally miss because of childcare. Um, so that makes it less of a burden for students to have to um, try to approach someone they might view as intimidating, etc. And I will leave you with this quote from Audrey Lord um, in the following resources. Uh, so she once said that when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcomed. But when we're silent, we're still afraid. So it is better to speak. Um, if you have joined us here today, I imagine you have been grappling with these things, um, whether you have already faced them or whether you are anticipating them transpiring in future classes that you have. Um, so the suggestion here is if we are already having this issue, we might as well be part of the solution. Um, and speaking up is one of the many ways that we can make change. And it's, it's one of the most powerful ways that we can do that, particularly in a classroom. Um, and it's not only interrupting the isms, it's also modeling for students what it can look like um, to be an advocate for human rights and for equity, um, and to show folks how to do that in day-to-day -day life, which a lot of our students um, might be coming in without a whole lot of examples about how to do that, right? Um, whether it's because there's not as many folks in the field with your identity, or whether it's because uh, it's a, they're a they have a majority identity and they've just never had to think about it. And um, it can help model the way for that. Um, so I will leave us with that. And just a note that again, I'll make sure the slides um, get sent out to everyone. And just disclosure, this is almost all my work, but um, I don't know, I tend to think it's decent. Um, but just some of these uh, additional resources around things like pronouns, um, implicit bias, uh, and a few things around, this is a, a longer version of this kind of talk um, that's more generalized and outside the classroom. You're welcome to share that with folks who might find it useful. Um, and then my newest work has really been around why it's hard to talk about race um, and what it means to be anti-racist. So if you're interested in continuing those conversations, you're certainly welcome to um, take a look at those as well. And I will Lena, turn it back to Melinda. Thank you so very much. And I would um, invite everyone to, uh, because we can't be heard, to use our reactions for, for some applause. And we really do uh, appreciate your time.